All right, what's up, viewers, subscribers, and agents alike? It's your boy, Enlightened Supreme Prince, and I am coming to you today with a brand new portion of the series. And it's pretty much going to deal with um, today, um, the concepts of today, the historical analysis, and the present day economic crisis all merged into one subject. But before I proceed, since this is the beginning of the series, I always have to say this because there are some opportunists in the world who would like to probably try to make some, um, some afraid about the whole situation in regards to what I say and what I actually do on my channel. So let me proceed by saying this. This is not constitute legal advice, nor is it legal advice. The sole information is for informational and educational purposes only. Clear the air on that one. Now, what I want to talk about today is uh, the Successive Act of March 9th, 1933. And this is the Declaration of United States Bankruptcy. And the preceding acts that were established in 1913 and the Act of October 6, 1917, as amended, were passed as the Emergency Rule Act that was basically used to implement extra, extra um, governmental policy and control over the economics of American people. And 1933 was when the United States officially declared bankruptcy. And in that year um, was the, uh, was Woodrow, excuse me, was Franklin Delano Roosevelt's inaugural address where he basically asked Congress for pre-approved war powers to wage war. And the thing that most people don't know about Franklin Delano Roosevelt's inaugural address when he was actually talking to the American people was that he was saying that he wanted to use war powers as if indeed, as if in fact they were actually facing the foreign foe. So what does this mean? This means that particularly in Woodrow Wilson's address, he was saying that, in other words, the war would be upon the economics and the labor of the American people. It wasn't used as far as the war powers are concerned, weren't used for actually waging war against an, a foreign enemy. That didn't come much later until the beginning of World War II, which it depends on the historical aspect. It all depends on when you want to say it started. So, furthermore, history in that later. But, long story short, when this policy was implemented against the people of, of the United States and uh, the what they call then the American Republic, but it's not a republic. It's a corporation. And for the most part, that everyone that was supposed to be uh, born on the face of this continent were to be used and placed as collateral. So the governors of the then 44 states in 1933 basically said, you know, well, we're going to take all the citizenry and we're going to pledge them. And we're going to pledge all the citizenry as collateral because we know that there is an economic instability because this is the only logical way that we can actually fund government because we know that the principal atmosphere economically is is destabilized. Come a few years later, uh, 1936, they passed um, what was called the New Deal era, basically the New Deal program. These were, instead of it being an independent America, or instead of it being an actual functional America, so to speak, it was actually now a welfare state. So it went from the warfare to the welfare state and Laissez faire, which was basically the economic atmosphere prior to 1933, was basically what the American people were doing. They were just basically becoming and, 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 and stable, instilling their lifestyle with economic independence. And this is what they wanted to take away from people. But this is the same thing that's going on today. The whole epidemic, the idea of what's, what's really going on, is, is, is not societal. It's more economic in its approach because the fundamentals are to destabilize the economy first and foremost, which are the long-term effects, but under the under the auspices that this is a false flag, much less um, a CIA, a CIA engineered false flag, so to speak. Um, the nations that were affected the most are very, um, very, uh, important to realize today, like why are, why are these specific nations actually involved? Like China, so to speak, today was prior to this incident, and one of the countries that um, United States 
um, had a bit of a debacle over the North Atlantic Free Trade Agreement uh, ideology, and, and it was renewed under pressure from the from the inside, not by Trump himself, who didn't want to do it, but it was basically to raise taxes on the import ex importation exportation of goods to the United States. So six months later, after that situation took place, what happens? Now you have this situation which affected China first. You see what I'm saying? So long story made entirely short. It's also, uh, it, it stagnated the trade at that point in time between the United States and China because it was a national emergency declared on China's behalf. Now the United States, um, the cases were uh, post 9-11, the Patriot Act and the limitation of the public usage of utilities and services into in a time of declared national emergency to hand those um, powers to the federal government. It's the same thing that happens today. So it's a, it's, a, it's a lot more that's going on behind the scenes that is, is proposed to the media that they're not really telling you about. But these things are historical precedents in Italy and other countries of Europe, you know, the UK, where these viruses, these are all interdependent, interdependent countries that all have some similar relation to each other. Um, so back to what I was saying about 1933, the economic destabilization of society is what the main primary agenda really is. And most people don't really pay attention to history. And I, I think that because um, either the school systems or whether they're educators or whether, whether or not they wish to go get education from somewhere else or instead, instead of failing to educate themselves don't really know what real history really is. So with these acts being passed and established, we also had to take a look into what took place in um, the same era. On April 5th, 1933, there was an executive order passed where it was the, the gold, to ownership of gold was actually illegal. If anyone would like to actually receive a copy of that, please email me. But the specifics are that if you don't have the capacity in commerce to pay debts, then you lose and relinquish sovereignty. So sovereignty is more so than just status. It's about the capability of being able to pay your debts in law. But in 1933, the mechanical ideology was to take the capacity of the people to pay debts in law to forever let them remain debtors, to forever let them be considered chattel or to be considered transferable property or transmitting utilities, whatever you wish to say, um, in the commercial sense. The people were to be obligated and the government was to enforce the obligations that were to come from the lien and debt-based program of socialist coverage, which is why we have the social security number. And that's one of the things that we'll talk about at a later series. There's so many things to merge into one conversation, but I'll stick to the point in this. Um, the basis is once the gold was actually taken from the American people and the ability for them to actually pay their debts were removed from them, that forever locked the societal complex of people into basically remaining economic debt servants. So if you want rights in this country, you have to sell your capability to be able to pay debts. And that's just basically your sovereignty, your standing in law to forever let you remain a debtor because that switches your position. It also allows what transfers to your hands to go to the property of the government, which is to be the, the primary purpose and control of what government is. Um, also to mention, the same year, um, June 5th, 1933, there was a House Joint Resolution that was passed called House Joint Resolution 192, passed June 5th, 1933. And this was basically what the establishment used so they wouldn't go to jail for committing fraud because that's that's how businesses ran. That's how most businesses ran, under fraudulent auspices. And they said, you know what, since in, in, in the legalistic sense, um, they said, well, basically, in order for us to ensure that we basically make sure that we're holding the government interest at, at heart, what we're going to do is we're going to basically make ourselves liable for the payment of the debts since we took the capability of people to actually pay debts. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and read this because I think it will be more uh, exponential if I can go ahead and read it. 
for the sake of people who have little to no information in regards to this. Um, House Joint Resolution 192 is one of those instances where legally, if you're not aware of the language that's used in regards to it, you would be misled. So let me read it and then I'll break it down as is. Public Policy House Joint Resolution 192, Joint Resolution to Suspend the Gold Standard and Navigate the Gold Clause, June 5th, 1933. House Joint Resolution 192, 73rd Congress, First Session. Joint Resolution to assure the uniform value of coins and the currencies of the United States. Whereas the holding of or dealing of gold in effect to the public interest, the government interest, and therefore is subject to proper regulation and restriction. And whereas the existing emergency has to disclose that provisions of obligations which purport to give the obligee a right to require the payment in gold or a particular kind of coin or currency of the United States, the corporation, or the Federal Reserve System, or in an amount of money to the United States, the corporation, measured thereby, obstruct the power of Congress to regulate the value of money of the United States, the corporation, and are inconsistent with the declared policy of Congress to maintain at all times the equal power of every dollar coined or issued by the United States in the markets and the payment of debts. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America and Congress assemble that a every provision contained in or made with respect to any obligation which purports to give the obligee a right to require payment in gold or a particular kind of coin or currency or in an amount in money of the United States, the corporation measured thereby is declared to be against public policy, the public officials and servants. And no such provision shall be contained in or made with respect to any obligation hereafter incurred, every obligation heretofore or hereafter incurred, whether or not such any provisions contained therein or made with respect thereto, shall be discharged upon payment, dollar for dollar, in any such coin or currency which at the time of payment legal tender for public and private debts, any such provision contained in any law authorizing obligations to be issued by or under the authority of the United States hereby repealed. But the repeal of any such provision shall not invalidate any other provision or authority contained in such law. Subsection B. As used in this resolution, the term obligation means an obligation, including every obligation, and to the United States, the corporation, except in currency, Federal Reserve notes, and circulating notes of the Federal Reserve Banks and National Banking Associations. Section 2. The last sentence of paragraph 1 of subsection B of section 43 of the Act, entitled An Act to Relieve the Existing National Economic Emergency by Increasing Agricultural Purchasing Power, to raise revenue for the extraordinary expenses incurred by reason of such emergency, to provide emergency relief with respect to agricultural indebtedness to provide for the orderly liquidation of joint stock land banks and for all other purposes. Other purposes. Approved May 12, 1933, is amended to read as follows. All coin and currencies of the United States, the corporation, including Federal Reserve notes and circulating notes to the Federal Reserve Banks and National Banking Associations, heretofore, hereafter, coined or issued, shall be legal tender for all debts for public and private, public charges, taxes, duties, and dues, except that gold coins which below the standard weight and limit of tolerance provided by law for the single piece shall be legal tender only at valuation in proportion to their actual weight. Approved June 5th. 1933, 4.30 p.m. This is Public Policy House Joint Resolution 192. This is actually a resolution. It's not my conjecture. So for the people who are there who wish to make it seem like this is something that I made up, it's not. It's something I made up. This is actual factual law. This is re resolved. Certain cases, people say that the law has been repealed, but it hasn't. The law has been amended by public law, and it hasn't been repealed. It's only been statutorily enforced and encoded because at the 1972, which is the implementation of the Uniform Commercial Code in the United States, the recognition of it anyway, that's when you actually had the capacity of this actually being statutorily enforced. So it's still on the law books. It still works. It's how government's been working. You can't repeal an effect of something that basically the government's liable for. And they basically say, you know what? We are going to take the debt on to ourselves, but this is how they get paid today. They take the obligation and they basically put it against you or the corporation of yourself, and then they make you accept the responsibility. You haven't been informed as opposed to the full disclosure of what it is that they actually presented to you. You're not informed of these contracts because you don't know the legal side of what the contract really enforces, but you only know the generalistic point. 
the standpoint to say, let me obligate myself to something. Let me basically make myself responsible for something that they're supposed to be responsible for. So on my channel, the which is my next video, which will be about the beginning of the redemption process, is to basically allow people an, an introspective look into what the preceding economic emergencies were and will be and are today. So the basis of the idea is that now and more of a time today in history, more people need to learn properly. So how to actually obligate the government in responses to their, their debts and their obligations, their public charges, and not to take them on to themselves because it's going to rob you of a livelihood of, or a well-meaning existence. Um, most people have, on other channels, have gotten the concept very, very misconstrued. They speak about bonds and birth certificate bonds and all these things. Those things I do not promote on my channel at all, nor have I ever done so. Because in order for you to print a bond on bond paper and actually put, place an amount on it without actually having a Federal Reserve accreditation of some sort, that's called counterfeiting. And that's going to get the people who actually use them in certain cases or actually wish to use them a lot of time in federal prison. I promote the acceptance for value concept on my channel. The acceptance for value is all you can do in a capitalist socialist system because you don't have a means to pay debt. Some other channels also have been telling people that you can use House Joint Resolution 192 to pay bills. They're right, but they're wrong as hell because you have to realize debts and expenses are two different things. If you have a utility bill, you can't pay with House Joint Resolution 192. You have to pay because it's a reasonable expense incurred. It's not some concept that basically you're going to basically make the utility companies responsible for something that you're utilizing. It's a reasonable expense incurred. So really what people really need more now than any other time in history is to really understand what economic education really is. Some other channels also make you believe that you can also do some astounding things, and, and none of these things are factual. You know, I'll be the first to say it, if, if the only person on YouTube to say it. You know, there's no secret account where you can go tap into unreserved millions of dollars. There is no, that's, that, that's, 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 that's false. And the reason it's false is because you didn't create it. So if you didn't create it, you can't be assured of what's there. The Social Security and the actual um, birth certificate number is just basically a stock. It's, it's a stock number. It's a number that was created by an entity, but only the only person who keeps that stock alive is the person who's actually not the sole beneficiary, which is the person who owns the Social Security number. So if you use that number, then you're going to be considered the, the uh, obligee. You're basically the person that's obligated to basically fulfill the... Um, commercial obligations that are placed against that entity. So in other words, you're transferring your wealth by usage of this number. So taxpayers, they transfer their wealth over to the socialist system by usage of the number. So people who also receive benefits, they transfer their wealth to the socialist system by the usage of the number. And this is what this program is implemented for. This is why these steps were taken in March 9th, 1933. But they covered their asses in June 5th, 1933 to keep them from going to prison. But they also made the remedy of the socialistic system hidden. They hid it, they hid it for a very long time. And that's the second part that I have to go into because they hid it with specific intent to rob you because if you ever figured out what it really was or what it really is and it could actually manifest it, you would no longer be obligated. And that means that many other millions of Americans today would be in a better, a better position and better standing before the law and before their economic um, economic institutions right so i'm going to go ahead and wrap this video up and i'm going to get ready to begin to embark upon this arduous task of the explanation of the redemption process so stay tuned peace lay y'all and agents you know what it is <laughs>